today. And so let's begin here in 3 John at verse 1. And I'll, I'll read the chapters, only 14 verses. We'll get into our study. 3 John, beginning at verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well, because... They went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. We also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. All right, here we go. Third John. Third John centers on three people. We just noted them. Three people in a local church. The three people that we just read about are, are Gaius, Diotrephes, and a man by the name of Demetrius. As we went through this, I want you to remember that we just noted that uh, Gaius and Demetrius were mentioned in a very positive way, but Diotrephes was mentioned in a negative way, and we'll be seeing him again in just a few moments when we look at verses 9 through 11. Um, as you look at this, there are parallels between 2nd and 3rd John. And because there are certain parallels between the two books, that gives reason to scholars to date this book around the same time as 2 John was written, and 2 John was written around the year 90 A.D. The purpose of this book is to encourage a man by the name of Gaius that he might continue in his Christian service to those who are in need. So the question has to be asked, why would John be writing a letter to a man by the name of Gaius with the intent of encouraging him to continue serving the Lord in the manner that he had. Why would that kind of encouragement be necessary? I mean, there are those who would think that serving God in and of itself is not only fulfilling, but is a lot of fun. And indeed it is. There, there, there's a whole lot of fun and joy in serving the Lord. But there are those who would, who would say, um, I, I, isn't that what you're supposed to have every day? I mean, walking with the Lord... It, isn't it just every morning is, is just a great morning? You know, you wake up and, and, you know, the sun is shining and there are birds singing outside your window. And, and if you're married, your wife turns and says, oh, baby, I love you. And she doesn't have morning breath. I mean, it's just a great, isn't life great serving the Lord? Indeed it is, of course. I mean, what other life is there that is more fulfilling than the life of serving Jesus Christ? There is no... There is nothing, there is no other thing in life that is as fulfilling. But that doesn't mean that serving the Lord is always fun. Because sometimes it's just plain difficult, isn't it? Sometimes walking with the Lord isn't as easy as we would like it to be. Sometimes it's real tough. Sometimes it's, it, it, you can go through pain and you can go through sorrow and disappointments, you know, ministry. And we're, we're looking at ministry here when he's speaking to Gaius, a man who's walking in truth is truly loved by John. And, you know, he's a man who was serving the Lord. 
Uh, ministry, in the context of speaking of Gaius and Diotrephes as one who is also serving the Lord in a proper way, ministry can be very, very tough. Ministry very often is thankless. It's not that you do ministry to hear thank you. As a matter of fact, the one thank you that you want to hear is from Jesus, and it's not even a thank you. It's a well done that you want to hear from him. But uh, it really is, in many ways, a very thankless way of life. You see, those who enter into a deeper service to the Lord sometimes can be overwhelmed, and you can be overwhelmed by the problems that people have. Uh, we all know this. We know that people can be demanding. We know that they can be mean. We know that people can be cutting and bitter. We know that people can be judgmental and vulgar. They can be angry and self-righteous. They can say what is on their mind. They can complain and criticize. They can be intentionally hurtful. And, and that's, just, that's just my staff. You ought to see other people. You see, instead of dying to self, which is what we're called to do, there are many who profess to know Jesus Christ, and I'm not saying that they don't, by the way, but there are many who profess to know him who are expecting others to always serve them, who expect others to make their lives better for them. And in churches, there are people who can be hurtful, and can make serving the Lord very difficult in many ways. It's interesting how when the Apostle Paul was writing to the church of Galatia, how he spoke to them and gave them a warning. It's found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Uh, there the Apostle Paul said, If you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you bite and devour, you may consume each other. And he had to speak to a group of people who, who, who are Christians, but he said, you need to walk in the spirit. You need to be careful that you don't destroy one another. You see, people sometimes in, in churches just like this can make unreasonable requests. And, and if you don't do what they want you to do, then they are very quick to say, well, you're not a Christian. Because if you were a Christian, you would have done what I needed you to do for me. And there are people who will make demands that are improper, and, and you may have this heart to want to do the right thing and all, and, and sometimes they will ask you to do something that is really not necessarily the thing you're supposed to do, but you can actually begin to feel that you're obligated to because somebody needs you to, and after all, you want to serve the Lord with all of your heart, and it could be a trap. I was a young man, and I was in ministry. I was in my late 20s at the time. And I got a phone call at my house from a lady who was in the church that I was the assisting pastor in. And she had called my house. She had somehow gotten my home phone number, and she called my house, and uh, she said, you know, my husband is a, is a truck driver. He's one of these long-haul drivers who leaves out of state. And she says, and I'm here alone, and I'm afraid. I'm afraid to be here by myself. And she's speaking to me on the phone, and it's a Saturday evening. And she says, can you come and spend the night at my house? So I, I said, well, let me ask Marie. <laughs> That's a true story. That's true. This, it's true. I'm not, I'm not teasing you. It's true. Let me ask my wife. So I call Marie over. I said, baby, I said, there's a lady who's afraid to be alone, and she wants me to come and spend the night at her house. She's going to have me sleep on her couch because she's afraid. Now, listen, I'm wanting to serve God. I'm wanting to be there for somebody in need. That's the whole motivation. I don't know who this woman is. She, she told me her name, and, but I, I didn't know who she was. But she was in need. So I tell my wife, baby, should I go up there and spend the night? And Marie is very innocent. My wife is innocent, too. And she says, well, whatever the Lord leads you to do, honey. <laughs> she says, but why didn't you call Marco? Now, Marco was the pastor of the church that I served. So I said, OK. I tell the lady, I said, um, 
uh, let me call the pastor and see what his advice is on this. She says, okay, what's your phone number? I say, she gives it to me, and I said, I'll call you back in a few minutes. And I called Marco, and he said, Marco, there's a woman who's afraid. Her husband's a long-haul driver. He's not around. She wants me to sleep on her couch to protect her because she's afraid. No, I'm stupid. I mean, I'm going to leave my wife and my small children alone, unprotected. But at the same time, I'm thinking, this woman's in need. See, that's what happens. So Marco says, no, <laughs> no, no. He said, you know, that can be a trap. And you know that you could get, maybe have a problem. And I hadn't thought about it. And so I didn't go. I didn't go. But I'll tell you, those things come up. You know, if I ever sat down and wrote a book, I, I could tell you stories that are, are not like that, but similar in so many ways where you want to serve the Lord, but sometimes the demands that are made can be so difficult. And when you don't yield to the demand, then immediately the person who didn't get their way with you in whatever way it was that they wanted to get their way, um, you're the bad person. And you can feel bad. You can feel bad because you didn't do it. People can be very demanding, and that's a fact. And so John is writing, and John is writing to a man by the name of Gaius, and he's encouraging him. He's encouraging him to continue his service to the Lord. And he wants him to remember that the work that he's doing for the Lord is not going unnoticed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so John is encouraging him to remain faithful. You see, doing good can sometimes seem to be a thankless job. But we look forward to the reward. In Galatians, again in chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Paul said, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. In 2 Thessalonians 3.13, as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And so he's writing to encourage this man to remain faithfully doing that which he has been called to do. And so one, he's writing to encourage Gaius to remain faithful in his service to God. And secondly, and we'll see this in a moment, he writes to expose the prideful power hunger of a pastor named Diotrephes. Diotrephes was arrogant. He was a proud pastor. He was what we would refer to as a control freak. He was a total dominator is what he was. And he was using his position to undermine John, the apostle, the last remaining one, the last one standing, the last one alive, He's, he's using his position to undermine the apostolic authority of the apostle John. He's controlling the church in order to elevate himself. Now, here's another thing for us as I'm introducing this and laying a foundation. We need to remember that ministry is not a pecking order of spiritual greatness. And it is not a position that is intended to be exercised in the manner that power positions can be exercised here in the United States. It isn't that way. You, 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 we have public servants in, in our church, and there are those who, who, you know, police officers are public servants, you know, and uh, various people in political positions uh, originally and for the longest time have been referred to as public servants, and that's what they're supposed to be. The uh, number one servant of the public is really supposed to be our president, public servants. That's what they're supposed to be. And for the longest time, there has been a, a, an acknowledgment of that, that fact. And yet, what have we seen over the history of this, of this great country of ours, if, if it isn't that people who enter into politics eventually become people who get rich off of politics and see somewhere along the line seeing themselves as being servants of the people and begin to dominate. I mean, that's something that, that happens, and we've seen it take place. Ministry is a place of service. 
and, and care for others is what is supposed to be done and is to be occupied, this ministry is to be occupied by those that are referred to as servant leaders. In, uh, in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 20, in verses 25 through 28, Matthew writes, Jesus called them together and said, you know that in this world, kings are tyrants and officials lorded over the people beneath them, but among you, it should be quite different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must become your slave. For even I, the son of man came here not to be served, but to serve others and to give my life as a ransom for many. It has been said that the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. When you look at corporations and you look at the executive positions and all, they're usually in a pyramid. And at the very top of the pyramid, you'll have the CEO, president, or whatever that office, whatever the title may be. And then you have the echelons of others to the foundational workers who are the minimum wage workers and all. The kingdom of God isn't supposed to be a pyramid of that nature. It's actually reversed because the greatest in the kingdom is the servant. And Jesus said the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Diotrephes doesn't understand that. He wants the preeminence. He wants to be well known. He wants to exercise authority. And he's become a bully and he's become a tyrant. He didn't understand the heart of ministry. It's interesting how it says, notice in verse 9, how it says he loves the preeminence. Now, when it says he loved the preeminence, he might have grown to enjoy being the center of the attention in that church. It, it doesn't say, but that there, are, there are ways. Let's, I, let's see. Okay, I know that I may have pastors in here right now. Sometimes we have pastors who are taking vacations and come and visit us. Perhaps I have a pastor here or, or somebody who is a staff member in a church somewhere else. And I'll perhaps it's happened in the past. It could happen tonight. Um, when you begin a ministry, very often what happens is, I mean, you, you do everything, everything. You know, one of the reasons why Calvary Chapel Ministries can be uh, successful is because they're uncomplicated. Our ministries are uncomplicated. You know, um, when this church first began, anything that needed to be done, needed to be done, well, it wasn't that tough to do. I mean. Marie was the first children's ministry overseer. I mean, if you go into the, into the main sanctuary and you look at the little calendar that we have there and you start looking at the different pictures, perhaps some of you have already done this, there's one picture that, where there's a young woman who's, who's ministering to some children. Perhaps you've seen that picture. If you look at that picture closely, that's Marie. Marie's in that picture. And the first kid that you see sitting there is my son David when he was a little boy. And next to him is my niece, Charity. And next to him is one of the little boys in the church named Adam, whom I knew since he was eight months old. And so what you have is a very basic church. When we started our church, we, you know, we, we, we didn't have really what you'd call a worship team. We had a guitar player and two guitar players and vocalists. We, we didn't have uh, our first bulletin. I mean, our first bulletin, I still remember it because a guy named Steve wrote, uh, read it and he said, uh, events of the week. And he said, um, uh, Monday, nothing. <laughs> Tuesday, nothing. Then he said, Wednesday, we have a home Bible study. Everybody cheers. I mean, all 30 of us, yay, you know. Thursday, nothing. Friday, nothing. Saturday, nothing. Sunday, we're going to get together again. Yay, that was it. That was our bulletin. That was it. I remember Marie taking the kids out for a walk as part of their curriculum, I guess. I don't know. For Sunday school, there were only about 10 of them. And she came running back to the house because they had upset a hive of bees, and the bees were chasing them down the street. So... So things started out very small. Don't have worship teams, don't have buildings, don't have multiple staff. I remember when my board said to me, we want to buy a tape duplication machine. And I said, why? So that we can duplicate the tapes. I said, why? Who's going to want to hear it more than once? 
That's a fact. Who's going to want to hear this more than once? Well, they're asking for tapes. Ah, I don't think so. Why would, why, no, I don't think so. Why would we do that? How much, how much will it cost for a tape duplicator? It was several hundred dollars. I said, I don't think so. It's too expensive, and, and I thought it was. And I also said, if we spend that money on a tape duplicator so we can see one or two tapes go out, you're, you're spending my salary because we don't have any money in the bank. You're going to bankrupt us buying a tape duplicator. So I said to them, do, do you really feel the Lord is in this? Yes, we do. Is this something the Spirit of God is telling you to do? Yes, it is. And I said, then if that's of the Lord, then you need to get it. And do you know the next week, and we had a very small church, the next week, the next day, this was a Saturday, the next day when they received the offering, which we didn't take offerings, you know, we didn't receive offerings, we used to have coffee boxes, the amount of money that was necessary to pay for that tape duplicator, the offering was increased that one Sunday that covered that tape du duplicator. And, and you learn these things. This is ha these kinds of things have happened many times. You learn how when God guides, God provides. But when you, when you start thinking, well, look, at we've got 30 people. Listen, you, you don't run around boasting because you have 30 people in a church. And you don't run around boasting of how important and powerful you are because you have 60 people in a church. You don't do it when you have 200. Even though you may not know this, the average church on a Sunday morning in the United States has a membership of 65 people. I don't know if you knew that. That's the average. In the United States, on a Sunday morning, the average church of the 500,000 plus churches here in our great nation, the average church has 65 people in it. Churches uh, with over 65 people are actually unusual. You may not realize that because of where you live. But that's just a fact. And so you have 100, you have 200, you have 500, you have 1,000, you have 2,000. Whatever the case may be, you can begin to start thinking that you are very important. And that's what happened to Diotrephes. He loved to have the preeminence. It may be that Diotrephes was a younger man and John was an older man. And that Diotrephes is saying, I don't want to hear some old man. Why would I listen to an old man? Listen, today we have people, I've had people refer to me and some of my friends as the dinosaurs of Calvary Chapel. <laughs> because we're older men to them. And they're basically saying, get out of the way so we can lead. Get out of the way. We've got plenty to say. And uh, that's not unusual that that happens and it's even happening as I speak. Get out of the way so we can lead. And Diotrephes is a man, the scripture says, loves the preeminence. And so because of that, John has to deal with him. You see, church, church members need to be aware that they can contribute to that kind of self-importance that a pastor can have. The Corinthians, when you read 1 Corinthians, the Corinthians were men who were the people who were caught up with, uh, with comparing men. And, and when you read it from the very beginning, in the first chapter, the Apostle Paul, writing a word of correction to the Corinthians, tells them there are divisions amongst you because some are saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. And, and some are even going so far as saying, and I'm of Christ. I don't need any of you. I, I'm just going to be a pure Christ follower. And so he says, this is what's taking place. In chapter 3, he says, this kind of spirit is a spirit of carnality because you're exalting men. And if somebody has a weakness, a weakness of disposition where he needs to be the center of attention, there will always be somebody who will place him there. There will always be somebody who will say, oh, nobody preaches like so-and-so. Nobody is like so-and-so. Oh, he's just amazing, the voice of a God, that kind of thing. And if you aren't careful, you can buy into it. The same voices crying out one day, Hosanna, the next week are saying crucify. 
And that's why long, long ago, and I shared this with pastors and pastors' conferences and all, you never, I learned this a long time ago, you never take the worst thing people say to you because they don't know. And the best things that they say, don't listen to them. Because you're not as bad as they say and you're not as good as they say either. You're somewhere in the middle. So just enjoy serving Jesus and don't worry about being preeminent. See, Diotrephes had that problem. And that's one of the things I have to tell you in ministry that destroys churches. Now, as we begin, that's your introduction. <laughs> Gaius has welcomed ministers into his home. Gaius has, has cared for their needs. He, he's given them meals. He's lodged them. He's given them financial aid. He's taken care of their necessities. And in doing so, Gaius is simply living a Christian life. He's being obedient to Scripture's command. He's caring for people who are sacrificially serving the Lord. In Galatians, again in chapter 6, verse 10, it says, we have, As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Do good. Do good to all people. Uh, Hebrews 13, verses 1 and 2, keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, by, for by, by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. You know, the Bible says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And so Diotrephes, the pastor of the church, is opposed the guy is performing this kind of ministry because he wants to maintain his preeminence. You see, selfish ambition and a longing for power motivates his response. Now, Gaius was acting responsibly in helping these people because they were the genuine article. On the other hand, Diotrephes is in the wrong because his motives are impure. He's not acting as a shepherd. He's acting as a bully. He's not serving the people with humility. He's actually overbearing. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, the apostle said, Care for the flock of God entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you're eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care. Lead them by your good example. And so with that in mind, we can see why John chose to use certain words repeatedly in this letter. He uses the word beloved in love seven times. He uses the word truth and true seven times. And so he's saying this in verse 1, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. This is a very simple introduction. He is the elder, the last surviving apostle of the original twelve. He is the leading elder in the body of Christ. And so he's writing Gaius. Notice how he says, whom I love in truth. So that tells us this is a personal letter. It's to a member of the church that is pastored by Diotrephes. It's a simple affirmation. He says, I love you sincerely. Now, verse 2 is an interesting verse because it's been mis misinterpreted a lot of times, and perhaps some of you have heard this misinterpretation. It says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Um, this, is, this is a general blessing. This is not a guarantee that you will be in health and that you will be financially prosperous. I say that simply because this has been taken out of context many times. It was a common greeting during that period. It isn't a guarantee of health. It's not a guarantee of prosperity. What it is is a prayer, a blessing, a prayer of blessing for spiritual growth. And what John is saying here is this. He's saying, may God bless you in every aspect of your life. May he bless you physically. May he bless you spiritually. And may he bless you materially. Every aspect of your life, may God have his hand on you. But it's not a guarantee. It's not that if, if you read this and say, oh, check it out. I'm supposed to prosper in all things, so I'll go out and maybe I'll be the next, you know, mega millionaire, and that kind of thing. That's not what he's saying here at all. He's saying, may God bless your life. Keep that in mind. 
because sometimes you'll hear somebody on TV who will give you a guarantee that you're going to be perfectly healthy and always rich, and that's just not what the Scripture teaches. I didn't prepare a study to show you why, but Paul had said, I've learned to have much and I've learned to have little, but in all things I've learned one lesson, that's to be content. So whether I abound or whether I'm abased, in the center of the will of God, I'm always blessed. And so he says that. Now in verse 3, I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. John rejoices. He rejoices that Gaius is maturing in his walk with the Lord. This, by the way, is the sincere prayer of every shepherd. What, would, what, what causes a pastor's heart to rejoice? That his children, and he's talking about spiritual, those whom God has placed or entrusted in their care. It causes the pastor's heart to rejoice that his children walk in truth. There are times when I have people approach me and they'll say, I met so-and-so from your fellowship and I want to tell you what a blessing they are. And I can't tell you, I can't tell you what, what joy that causes my heart to have. It's a fact. I say, really? Yeah, oh, they're such a blessing. And I'll, and I'll say, oh, that's, that's great. Praise the Lord. And then there's been times when people have said, you know, I ran into a little stinker from your church. <laughs> and, and it causes your heart to have sorrow for every, on every level, for every reason. So you rejoice greatly when the children walk in truth. You, rejo you, you rejoice greatly, but it's, it's interesting that uh, his greatest desire is that they should have a habitual walk in their faith. You see, he's rejoicing because his Christian faith, John is rejoicing because guys, his Christian faith isn't simply intellectual, but it is practical. It's something that is, that is worked out. This is... This is a man who has been showing compassion for somebody in need, like the good Samaritan who, when he saw somebody in need, took some time and took some money and took some care and helped this guy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the simple things like that, though that took great sacrifice, by the way, for the Samaritan to do that. But it's the simple things like that that demonstrate the depth of a person's faith, whether it's very real or whether it's just something that is, is intellectual. Because there are a lot of people who have an intellectual faith, but not a practical faith. They're able to talk about Jesus and talk about the Bible and talk about doctrine and, and all of that, but they, they don't love people very much. And, and so you have, to, you have to have the knowledge of the things of the Lord, of course, because that's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And, and that with that sword, we wield it in a variety of ways. We, we use it sometimes as a, as a combat weapon in spiritual warfare, but it's also used as a, as a surgeon's scalpel that removes things that are deadly to the body of Christ. And it's always done with compassion. It's always done with love. You always minister at the love of the Holy Spirit, and that's what Gaius was doing. So he rejoiced, he says in verse 3, when brethren came and testified of the truth that's in you. Their, their, his life was, was so obvious that people actually came and spoke and said, this man is a true, a true follower of Jesus Christ. You know, the things that cause people to give testimony very often are the small things. It's the simple courtesies, the simple acts of kindness, that speak to people's hearts. Now, how was this shown? Well, he says in verse 5, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. The love was demonstrated by Gaius taking care of and supporting Christian ministers who had visited the church. Here's something for you that perhaps you already know or maybe you didn't know, but hospitality in the ancient world was looked at as a sacred duty. You read about the inns, you know. Oh, inns were generally dirty and flea-infested. 
And in the society, innkeepers really inhabited the lowest rung within that society. And, and here's the reason why. It's because they charged people for what should be given freely. What should be given freely is hospitality. And yet these people were making money off of those in need. Plato called innkeepers pirates who held guests for ransom before they allowed them to escape. So he probably stayed in a Motel 6. <laughs> the ancient world. The ancient world had a system of what is called guest friendships. Families would actually open their homes to family members from other countries. All the traveling family member had to do was to bring a token of some kind of proof, some identification that they were part of the family and they were automatically to be sheltered. That's how it worked. And so if heathens were generous in caring for traveling strangers, should not the church be more so? In 1 Peter 4, 9, it says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Oh no, your mom's gonna stay a week. Offer hospitality without grumbling. Romans 12, 13, share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. And so, he said, you've done well because they went forth in verse seven for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. You've taken care of them. Now, here's a couple of things I wanna share with you. Notice in verse six, how he says, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well because they went forth for his namesake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. One, he said, if you send them forward on their journey, the church's responsibility towards genuine ministers was to care for them generously. They would shelter them, they would feed them, they would encourage them, they'd provide funds for, their, for these traveling evangelists because they were worthy. He says, do so in a manner worthy of God. In other words, treat them as you would treat God himself. So the church had responsibility towards these people. Secondly, he says, they went forth for his name's sake. When it says they went forth for his name's sake, they went out for the sake of the Lord. They went everywhere for the sake of the Lord. Billy Graham, many years ago when he could still drive, was in... Uh, in one of the African nations that he was, he was driving on one of the paths and uh, decided that he was gonna make a U-turn on a dirt path. And so as he tried to navigate a U-turn, you know, he's trying to move his car, here comes a car up the same path and the person in the car that was traveling in the same path was an American journalist. And he got mad because Here's this guy blocking the lane. And so he sticks his head out the window and he yells at the driver of this car blocking him. And he says, this is what he says, this is a quote. He says, where are you going for Christ's sake? <laughs> and Billy Graham sticks his head out the window and he says, I go everywhere for Christ's sake. <laughs> well, see, that's the whole point. It says they went forth for his name's sake. Now, when it says for his name's sake, their motives were pure. They went out so that the name of Jesus Christ would be glorified. Listen, one of the things that's really important, in, especially in a day when people are looking for heroes, is there's really only, keep this in mind, and this is so practical that I think it can be lost on us as a church. Um, there's only one hero that I know of, and that's Jesus Christ. There's only one. There's only one. And, and, I, and I, I, say that, I say that sincerely because a, a lot of times people can actually elevate a pastor who at one time had just been a humble servant to the position of a diatrophies by simply exalting him constantly. Oh, there's nobody like you. You're the best, you know, and bragging and boasting. And that's just, that's just not the proper thing to do. You have to be careful with those kinds of things. And you need to understand that we're all the same in the, in the face of the Lord. We're all the same. We, we, we're just basically taking the gifts that God gave to us and using them for his name's sake. And that's the way it should be. Everything that we do really ought to be for his name's sake. It's like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, when he said, we don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants for Jesus' sake. 
See, remember, the false teachers had gone out in their own authority, and they were making a profit off the people, but these ministers went out for the name of the Lord. And so he says in verse 7, they went forth for his name's sake, notice, taking nothing of the Gentiles. They were ministers, not mercenaries. And the church does have an obligation to support the spread of the gospel. The world does not have that responsibility to support the spread of the gospel. The church does. trying to remember some details of something that happened a long time ago that could probably fit into this as an illustration. <coughs> many, many years ago, we were invited by a group of churches when we were in Ontario, so it's been a long time ago. We were invited by a group of churches to be part of, a, um, of an outreach that they were planning to do in the city of Chino. They were going to be renting the Chino High School Stadium, and it was going to be on 4th of July, and uh, apparently they had done it before, and, and they wanted the community to come as a community event, and they wanted to have preaching of the gospel and this and that. And they invited me to come and to join it on their meeting. While we were there, they began to speak concerning a variety of things, and, and uh, I, apparently they had done it before, and one of the pastors who was part of the meeting said, he had said something like, well, last year we had this event, and when we received the offering, uh, two young men came walking past me, and one said under his breath, I knew nothing's free, and walked past. And the pastor said something to the effect of, I wanted to tell him, then just get out of here if you're not willing to pay for it. And that's what the pastor said in this meeting with other pastors. And I, I am uh, very quiet when I go to meetings. I don't talk. I just kind of sit there and I listen kind of creeps them out, but I, I, just, I just sit there. <laughs> I, I have anything to say, so I just sit there. And if they ask me to speak, I do. If they don't, then I remain quiet. And so that's what I was doing. And finally, one of the pastors who was there said to me, they said, David, can you tell us how you receive offerings? Well, at that time, we didn't receive offerings. And so I said, you're asking the wrong person about receiving offerings. Well, why is that? I said, we don't receive them at our church. Well, then how do you... How do you support your ministry? I said, I teach the Bible and people love Jesus and they give. Kind of a novel idea, isn't it? They didn't know what to do with that. And so when I said that, it got kind of quiet. I said, but I want to say something. And I pointed to the pastor who had just made that comment. I said, what you just said really disturbed me. I said, because, I said, we've got enough people in this room here that if we wanted, we could pool our resources and put this outreach on for free. We could do it as a gift to the community. I said, because what you just said, when you said there's nothing free, I said, salvation in Jesus Christ is free. And we, as a group of people, we could put this on. And, then, and they didn't. They didn't. They didn't go for that idea for some reason. I'm not sure exactly why. And I wasn't invited to the next meeting, so I don't know what they did <laughs> after that. I, I got disinvited to many meetings at the beginning of our ministry. But, but it's still the truth, isn't it? It's still the truth. I mean, the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you're evangelizing, you they they said, well, we're not charging. I just remember they said we're not charging for the fireworks. We're we're. No, we're not charging for the gospel. We're charging for the fireworks because it was a fireworks display. And I said, so what you're going to do is you're going to charge the, the fish for the bait that you use to catch them. And they didn't like that. But it was true. <laughs> but it was true. Because freely you have received in evangelism, freely give. Freely give. Because that's how... It works, I, best to the, I, I believe, best, at least in the general local area, for the glory of God. And so they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. You see, there's a Calvary Chapel thing that I'll give you right now. Everybody who's Calvary knows this, where God guides, God provides. If God's in it, he'll take care of it. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13 and 14, do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? Those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? 
Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. There's nothing wrong with supporting those who are going out because God provides in that fashion. So he says in verse 8, we therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. In giving to them, notice fellow workers for the truth, in giving to them, supporting them, we are partaking in the work and the fruit as well as the rewards. You may not be a missionary. You, you may not be a full-time minister of any sort. You may be volunteering and doing all, or maybe there's very little that you actually are free to be able to do at this season in your life. But in your prayerful support, in your giving, in your prayers, you receive the reward along with others. You receive... My mama, when she was very ill, my mama... Um, was very frustrated because she, she was so crippled that so she couldn't do anything. And, and she, her last year of life, she had just lay in a bed until she, until she died. I mean, my mom was unable to walk. She had broken back and, and, and all. And she's just unable to, to, to function anymore. And she was so, so upset that she couldn't speak and she couldn't go and she couldn't share because she was just a go-getter, my mom. Um, and I used to encourage her and I'd say, Mama, Mama, you are a prayer warrior, though. If, if ever I have a need, or Marie has a need, my children have a need, I know who to go to for prayer. You're always there. And my mom was one of these who prayed all the time. That's what she did. You know, so you do what you can. And, and in your ministry, very often when, when you're giving and all of that, which is what he's talking about, and the support, um, you partake in the reward because as you've given, you actually reap the reward also. With that said, we get to this man, Diotrephes. Uh, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, doesn't receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what's evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil hasn't seen God. Diotrephes didn't want any teaching in the church but his own. He's a tyrant. And John was careful because he's now exercising ministerial authority. And he's basically saying, when I see him, I will correct him. I will deal with him. Notice what he says in verse 10. If I come, I'll call to mind his deeds, which he does. That's a very, very strong statement, by the way. What he's literally saying is, I will take up the matter with him. So John is going to exercise authority. He will personally correct this man. Now, if Diotrephes is a genuine man of God, he will receive the correction, and he will move forward. One of the uh, models for, for us in Scripture of a man who knew how to receive Instruction is a man by the name of Apollos. Apollos is mentioned in the book of Acts and in other places. But in Acts 18, uh, Apollos was a man who the scripture refers to as being very eloquent and very powerful in scripture. But he only knew the <laughs> baptism of John. But that which he knew, and he was very, very, again, very, very well spoken very intellectual. He had charismatic gifts in the sense of personal charismatic gifts. He was the kind of young man that, that you heard him speak and you would say, man, this guy, this guy really, he's spellbinding in the way he speaks. And he's so, he speaks so well and he's so studious. He, he, he's just greatly to be admired. And listen, um, as, a, as an older guy, I, I admire the fire that I see in, in some of the younger preachers. I really do. I admire it. I said, boy, those guys, you know, they are on fire. Well, that was Apollos. That was Apollos. He was that guy that when he spoke, you were on the edge of your chair and you were listening to this guy because he was eloquent and studious. And those two combinate, that, that combination, it's amazing. It really is, because it makes for a spellbinding communicator. But there was a couple in the church, if you will, in the synagogue, listening to him speak. And they 
realized that all he really knew was the baptism of John. In other words, he didn't have the full understanding of the gospel and its consummation in Christ or anything like that. He just knew some of the essentials. And when he spoke, he spoke with the power and eloquence and charisma that was spellbinding, but he was lacking. And so the Bible tells us something. Uh, the Bible tells us that this man named Aquila and his wife Priscilla took him aside and spoke to him. And it says in Acts 18, 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. That, for you, any young teacher I have in this room, that is a very, very important scripture. Because Apollos listened to what they had to say, and as a result, became even more powerful in his presentation of the gospel. When you're a young guy and you think you've got it all together and look at all the people who come to listen to me. No, you don't know as you ought to know, not yet. Old couple driving through town on their way to a church that the, the older man, the older pastor was gonna preach at, stopped in this small town and went to church. A young man was up there spellbinding, great communicator. And so when the couple leave the church and they're driving away, the, the older man's wife turns to him and says to him, that young man is a great pastor. And the older man says, no, he's not, not yet. She looks at him like, what are you, jealous? What do you mean? He hasn't suffered yet. Years later, they were going through the same town. They went in, and they heard the same guy. He was still there. But he'd gone through a lot of pain. He'd gone through hard times, heartaches. And at the end of that message, when the old man and his wife were driving away, he turned to his wife and he said, now he's a great preacher. Anybody can get into a commentary and make a great message from it. It isn't hard to do. It's harder to live that message. Anybody can speak about sorrow when they've had very little of it. And many people can talk about how to overcome suffering when they haven't suffered very much. But when you've gone to the doctor, and the doctor has said to you these things that shake you to the core. When you put your hands on a steering wheel on the 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock position, and you grip it, and you say, what am I going to do? That's when you begin to learn how good God is, and how deep God is, and how powerful God is and how true God is to his word. Because when I was a younger man, I, I was an expert at raising kids because I didn't have any. <laughs> I could tell you, I, I was in a social, social, uh, social psychology class and, and my Karini at that time was several months old. And I said, in the class, it was at Cal Poly Pomona, I said, we were talking about difficult teenagers, and I've got a baby less than a year old, and I'm saying, I'm not gonna have those problems. I told the class that. I'm not gonna have those problems. And they looked at me like, oh, really? And I said, no, I said, no, I'm, ra I'm a Christian. I'm raising them in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I did raise them in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, all four of them, but I did have some problems too <laughs> and you learn humility and you learn patience and you learn faith and you learn trust and you learn that you walk into the valley but you come out on the other side and that God never leaves you nor does he ever forsake you and you learn that God is good to his word and even though it doesn't happen immediately it does happen and you learn that you learn that and that's that, that's something that's part of growing up in Christ. It's a bottom line thing. And, and many times, I, I, I've, I have had, as, an, as a pastor, I've got many years experience now, and I've had young pastors instructing me on how to pastor churches. And sometimes 
they're right. There are things that I need to learn from them, and I will, because you better be humble enough to learn. But on the other hand, sometimes they just haven't learned themselves yet. And what they think is true, well, they're going to discover isn't. You see, it isn't. One of the marks of a genuinely spiritual leader is humility, the humility to receive instruction. It's understanding that you are a person under authority and as such can receive instruction. Diotrephes desired to be the most important person in the church. He needed correction. Now I'll close with a couple things and um, notice his tactics. We don't use the word prating, do we? When's the last time were you talking to somebody today and said, you know, he was prating against me today. That's not a word that we use. The word prating means to utter nonsense. To utter nonsense. To bring forward idle accusations. To make empty charges. He said, he's making empty charges against us. And uh, there are things, here's something for you, there are things that we in ministry learn that people very often will make empty charges. Um, I would say that I quote Paul the most because I identify with Paul a lot um, and, and the most open-hearted book that Paul writes is 2 Corinthians. And if you're a young minister, if you have a heart to serve the Lord in a ministry, and I know that there are some perhaps who are here tonight, if not, we'll hear this message someday. When you look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians is Paul's most open-hearted letter. People have asked me, what is your favorite New Testament book outside of the Gospels? 2 Corinthians. Why? Because it is Paul's most open-hearted book. He dealt with so many prating words. Uh, when you go through it, you'll, you'll see these are charges that were lodged against the Apostle Paul. He is selfish. He is not forthright. He changes his mind easily. He is self-appointed. He dominates people's faith. He is an unemotional intellect. He is legalistic. He prospers from the gospel personally. He has no credentials. He's self-righteous. He is deceitful. He preaches himself. He's crazy. He defrauds the church. He uses guilt to get money. He's a coward. He walks in the flesh. Paul is a failure. He's untrained in speech. He's unattractive. He's, he's not equal to the super apostles. He's not worth supporting. And he uses guilt to trap people. These are all accusations Paul deals with in 2 Corinthians. When somebody says, oh, you know, the ministry is an easy way of life, that's only because that person's not a full-time minister. They don't know. But Paul had to deal with that in 13 chapters, over 20 accusations that he dealt with. People use that. They will make the most unkind, mean comments. And uh, that's what was going on. It says he does not receive the brethren. He doesn't receive the brethren, which is another way of showing his authority. He refused to show hospitality. Third, he puts out of the church those who who uh, are recognizing these ministers as being of the Lord. So what he was doing is he was usurping John's biblical authority and was actually revealing his rebellious heart. And that's why it says, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God. He who does evil hasn't seen God. Don't follow his pattern. And finally, Demetrius has a good testimony from all, from the truth itself, we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I don't want, I don't wish to write to you with pen and ink. I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Don't imitate what is evil. Imitate what is good. Follow a better example. Follow John's. You see, Demetrius is a good testimony. He's a good example. Follow his example. He's blameless, and the facts speak for themselves with this man, and thus we give him a recommendation. And when I get there, and I hope to, I will take care of the problem. And as I deal with diatrophies, I will also fellowship with you. And the last couple things, he says, peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Be very careful. 
that you, now you may be a visitor here in this fellowship and you're more than welcome as a visitor, of course. But if you're a visitor to every church you go to and not planted there, it's unhealthy for you. It's unhealthy for you. People sometimes will plant themselves in one place and then uproot themselves. And it's just not healthy. Anybody here who has ever planted any kind of plant of any sort knows that if you plant it and you begin to let it root and then you uproot it and then plant it somewhere else, eventually what happens to that plant is it goes into root shock. It becomes unhealthy and may even die because it has to be rooted, it has to be grounded, in, it has to be placed in that and it has to allow the roots to go deep so that it can begin to bear fruit. And in the Christian church, there are a lot of people who uproot themselves from place to place. So it's interesting to me how he says, greet the friends by name. Because that shows us something about the early church. They actually knew each other. So he who has friends must first prove himself to be friendly. When you go to church, a church like this, if this is your home church, it's a good thing for you to learn other people's names if you can. It's a good thing to, to smile and to nod and to greet people. Those are all good things. And it's a good thing to become friends with others because we bear one another's burdens, we pray for one another, we love one another, we encourage one another. There are so many one another portions of scripture and it's very unhealthy today where people will have a Wednesday night church here, a Sunday morning church there, a Sunday night church here, and a Tuesday night fellowship there, and they move from place to place. Part of it is because I think that we're the church on wheels, we're nomadic in many ways. Uh, sometimes it's because now, we don't have stability in our own lives because we didn't have stability when we grew up. We didn't have a place that we saw as a permanent home with permanent family. I understand those dynamics, but the bottom line is, is the church is more than just a group of strangers sitting in an auditorium. And that's why John would say, beat them by name, get to know them, and give them love. 